second attempt to record this lecture. Um, this is Kathy Strand. My information is right here. Please contact me at cstrand at dcc.edu. As you know, um, you have your SLAs and your assignments. So please read through that and answer any of the activities so you'll be well prepared for the content I'm going to present. Remember, a lot of the content, and all of the content really, is taken out of your readings and activities. So please do so. Let's get started. When we talk about comfort, first of all, it's a complex phenomenon with multiple components. Pain can be psychological, emotional, physical, behavioral. And each patient has a physiological, sociocultural, spiritual, and psychological, um, all those different factors that influence the reaction to discomfort and pain. As you see, the 33 concepts here, comfort is also a part of this puzzle. And remember that we look at our bodies as a whole. And comfort, as you know, will affect all the systems of the body. Let's talk about pain. Pain is usually a protective mechanism. It's our body's alarm system that lets us know something's wrong from an injury, illness, or disease. Pain is the fifth vital sign and is assessed at least each time a patient's vital signs are checked. And it's also checked or assessed when a nurse is performing hourly rounds in the hospital or in inpatient healthcare settings. Pain is the most common reason people seek emergency health care. It's a high priority problem and it needs to be treated at the onset. Cusin states that the nurse must act promptly to relieve pain, but respect patients' preferences and values. Providing pain relief is a basic, basic human right and it's a, in the Patient Pain Care Bill of Rights. Nurses are legally and ethically responsible for managing pain and relieving suffering. Often, unrelieved pain is a common cause for lawsuits. Pain usually indicates a diseased or malfunctioning part or segment of the um, nervous system. So as nurses, we need to practice effective pain management techniques in an effort to improve the quality of care, to reduce physical discomfort, to promote early mobilization of the patient and help the patient return to their normal activities of daily living. Let's talk about the physiology of pain. In a very simplistic manner, the body senses a stimuli. Maybe they're touching a hot stove. The nerve impulses travel along the sensory nerve fibers to the spinal cord, then to the brain. The brain sends down a signal down the spinal cord to the motor nerves to remove the body part that perceived the pain from the stimuli. So the patient experiences minimal pain. And I think the main thing is that when we discuss this theory next, you'll understand why. You see, we're not going to test on anatomy and physiology. You should know that. But basically, if you understand this principle, you'll be able to understand why and what pain mechanisms or uh, strategies relieve pain. There were two researchers, Malzak and Wall, and these were two researchers and uh, studying pain. And it's the most widely accepted pain theory today. These two researchers stated that there are imaginary gates in the spinal cord that open when small peripheral nerve fibers are stimulated and it allows the person to feel or experience pain. It makes sense. If all the pain um, is sensed, it goes up, up the extremity, um, up the spinal cord to the brain, and from the brain on down to the area, to the motor, to remove the uh, body part that's being uh, experienced in the pain. So that's an open gate. Anxiety, fear lack of knowledge, sleep deprivation, or some examples that can open that gate. Now, when the large peripheral nerve fibers are stimulated, touch, cold, warm temperatures, those gates close and inhibit pain transmission. 
things that close the gate may be massage, guided imagery, relaxation exercises, exercise, distractions, knowledge. You know how they say knowledge is power? Well, if you were dying, or you thought you were dying, bad accident, you're in the middle of nowhere, you think you're dying, you're in severe pain, you know you're in bad shape. And then an emergency person comes and says, we got it covered, I'm giving you something, and in about three seconds, you're not going to have pain. We're going to take care of you. That knowledge can maybe be the determinant of life and death there. So knowledge, cutaneous stimulation. You know when your mom rubbed your bobo when you had it? Hey, mom was right, because she was stimulating those large nerve fibers, and it closed the gate, so you wouldn't experience the pain. So these imaginary gates are in the spinal cord. So it's kind of neat. So the small fibers open that gate, and the large fibers close that gate so I don't feel pain. Contralateral stimulation, I'll talk about that in a second. But anyway, contralateral stimulation. I have a cast on my leg, and it never fails, right? Everybody that has a cast, they all want to scratch underneath because it itches. Well, they can cause tissue damage, infection. It's not a good thing to do. But what you can give that patient a strategy that would help relieve it is on the opposite side of wherever it's itching or hurting, whatever, you can maybe scratch the opposite. Example, they have a cast on maybe on their right, right thigh. And, oh, man, it's itching, itching, itching. They're not supposed to stick anything down there. So if you scratch, <laughs> gently rub that area on the opposite extremity, opposite calf, they get relief. And it's contralateral stimulation. I think that's neat. TENS unit, they use these little electrodes. And they look like little EKG adhesive leads. They put it on either side of the painful area. And it emits a small uh, electrical current. And they raise this dial to a point where uh, the patient gets relief in that area. It kind of overrides the painful area, and the patient gets pain relief. So you'll see that using, used, too, uh, to close that gate. But this theory really helps us to uh, understand why these painful, uh, the, the non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic measures relieve pain. Now, Maslow's hierarchy. As you know, we have needs. And pain indicates an unmet need that demands attention. And um, if the pain is not relieved in any of these levels, uh, or if it is relieved, comfort is experienced when each of these hierarchy levels are fulfilled. Definitions. OK, they're in your handout. Uh, and they, two definitions were definitions of pain, unpleasant sensory emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage, and it's described in terms of damage. Okay, now the International Association of the Study of Pain defined this, and it's interesting, and it's possible. These are two definitions that you'll commonly see used. FYI, so a patient has a really lot of pain. Man, they are really fractured and suffering and bleeding and having a really bad time. And uh, then you have a person, they broke a leg. Now, the whole premise of this is just because the person that was really injured badly had more tissue injury and damage does not mean that that patient will experience the greater amount of pain. You see, each individual responds to pain differently. And pain is pretty subjective. Now, they, those two nurses I talked about uh, that came up with that theory, pain is whatever the person says it is, whenever they, the patient reports it, that is the most widely recognized and used uh, pain definition. You see, pain is subjective and is experienced differently in each patient. So remember that. And this definition leads us to the gold standard of pain. Ta-da! Remember that the patient's self-report is the most reliable indicator of pain. Whatever the patient tells us is what we should go by as far as pain relief. Very important. Types of painful stimuli. We have biological, bacteria, viruses, 
and uh, they can cause pain, as you know, with the uh, coronavirus and that. Uh, mechanical shearing force, you know, when we slide that patient up, drag that patient on the sheets, or they, they slide down in the bed and that top layer of skin comes off, that's mechanical. Fractures, that's another example. Thermal is body temperature, right? Extremes in heat, extremes in cold can cause painful stimuli. Electrical, electrical burns, electrical shock. Chemicals, chemical solutions. Tobacco is a chemical, tobacco smoke. Acids, bases, lye. Maybe if the patient is undergoing radiation, that can cause pain. And these stimuli will cause, will be the cause that determines your nursing diagnosis for pain. Now, as you know, our first step in any care is assessment. So we're going to interview the patient. They're going to give us some objective data. We'll get some objective data. And we're going to get, hopefully, a lot of subjective data. And that will be our first part of our assessment. The health history, what they tell us, right? They have chronic pain. They injured their back 20 years ago. They have chronic pain, um, injuries, maybe something that happened, whatever is in the history. And your health history, all this information is going to probably be in the doctor's and the physician's progress notes. So if you go there, you might get a lot more details and explanations. Look at the chief complaint. It's the patient's expression of pain by self-report, right? Why did they come to the emergency room? Now, since some patients won't describe their pain unless asked, nurses must assess and ask questions to see if the patient is in pain, okay? So you might have to ask them to describe it because some people aren't going to volunteer a lot of information. Use those open-ended questions. Pain can also be determined by observations of behaviors in nonverbal patients. You see, we may have patients that are intubated. They may be aphasic. They can't speak. They may be unconscious. Different reasons, right? Where we couldn't get any verbalization of their and information we need. So, to quantify it, they came up uh, with a behavioral scale. We're going to talk about that in a second. So we'd watch their body movements, maybe their facial expressions indicating pain. Maybe their teeth are clenched. They're holding that painful area. They're guarding it. You go to touch it, and they kind of walk away or kind of pull away from them. They're bent over. They're grimacing and frowning. Maybe they have some changes or absence in, in vital signs. Some patients may cry, moan. They get restless. Your elderly, depending on the cause, they can get confused or agitated. They may get real aggressive or make frequent requests to the nurse. The main thing is, remember, when we're assessing a patient's pain, you really shouldn't collect an in-depth pain history when a patient's experiencing severe discomfort. We may have to address it and then can obtain some of the details. The location of the pain is an important consideration. Where did the pain, where was the pain felt? Example, I have a patient that comes in complaining of chest pain. I have a patient that comes in complaining of knee pain. Which one would you, the nurse see first? Which one has the most likely um, possibility of being life-threatening? Of course, the person with chest pain, right? Another way we can indicate the location is by radiating pain, noting if it's radiating, meaning that it goes from the point of origin to other parts of the body. It spreads or extends from this place or over the organ where the pain started. It's like when a patient has a heart attack. Some patients, it's kind of like we think of the sun, right? You had the round corona, and then you had those rays coming off. And radiating means it starts maybe over the heart, fifth left intercostal space, midclavicular line, and then it goes from that part all the way up their arm, neck, back, or jaw, and that is radiating. It's over the area where the problem is and goes from there to other areas. That is radiating pain. Another way we can describe location is referred pain. And that's when it's felt away from the point of origin. Example, a patient that has a tubal pregnancy, they'll experience this severe pain in their shoulder. They come in, they're pale, of course, they're childbearing age. Their blood pressure is really the pits. I mean, they are in bad shape. Now, the problem is the pregnancy isn't in the uterus. It's maybe in the fallopian tube. And we got problems, okay? But wait a minute. 
problem is over the fallopian tubes, right? It's not there. The pain is in their shoulder. And that is the thing with referred pain. The organ pain is often perceived in a remote area away from where the true problem is. And the reason is that these nerve fibers that innervate the injured area from other areas of the body converge at the same level of the spinal cord. So that can account for the area uh, other than over the problem area um, is called referred pain. Let's do a quick quiz. A patient complains of pain going from the right buttocks down to the right foot, okay? Which term should the nurse describe the pain? Correct. Radiating. It goes down the right buttocks, down to the right foot, right? Radiating. Think of that sun over the point of origin, going from that point somewhere else. Let's look at the intensity of pain. And it can be communicated easily and usually reliably on a pain scale. You see, it kind of gives us an objective tool that helps us all, all the nurses and healthcare providers, compare the level of pain on a patient. So the main thing is we use the pain scale that best fits the patient, you see, because you'll be amazed at all the different types of pain scales. Usually agencies will use certain ones for certain types of pain. So you want to use the, the main thing is use the same pain scale with the same patient. So we get this, you know, a real objective um, measurement of the patient's pain on the same scale. So on a zero to 10 scale, Pain intensity can be mild pain, 1 to 3, moderate pain, 4 to 6, severe pain, 7 to 10. And at the end, we're going to go over the WHO ladder of uh, pain scales, and these numbers for each type of pain will be important. The sample pain. Let's look at, let's look at the sample pain scale. The first one is a numeric scale. It's an 11-point scale. The pain is rated from 0, which is indicates no pain, to 10, which is the worst pain a person can experience. The next scale would be the verbal descriptive scale. It uses words on a scale to indicate the pain intensity. The degree of pain interferes with the patient's ability to function, and usually with their activities of daily living. And that's a good indication of pain intensity. The next one is the visual analog. And I'm not going to put a pain scale and say, which one is it? I just want you to know that there are different types, so you'll be familiar, because your agency will probably use some of these. Uh, so the visual analog is when the patient points on the scale according to their perception of the severity of pain. So you might see that one also. A co very common one you'll see used is the Wong-Baker face scale. And uh, you'll see commonly used in most of the agencies here. Um, and it is on page 169 of volume one of your readings in the figure 3-7. And when you're using this scale, the nurse should point to each face using words to describe pain intensity and then ask the patient to choose the face that best describes their pain and document the number that the patient states. This scale is commonly used with patients who can't understand or use a numeric scale, maybe a preverbal child, a child at age three, Older adults with impairments maybe in cognition or, the, or communication. And people who don't speak English as a primary language. You see, they can relate uh, based on the faces. Now, we have a problem in that not all patients can verbally tell us the amount of pain because they're unconscious, they're intubated, they're aphasic, they can't speak or whatever. So they came up with different behavioral types of scales. And it's usually an opposite. I'm going to go over the FLAC scale. It's a behavioral scale. And it can be used with patients who are unable to verbalize their pain. It may be due to age. They're two months old to maybe to seven years old. Maybe they don't have the mental capacity, uh, advanced dementia. Maybe they're intubated and are unconscious. The nurse observes the behavior stated on the scale and assigns an appropriate score to the patient. Zero is the best score, and 10 is the worst. And they, they look at all of these areas and total the score. 
Uh, there are behavior, other behavioral scales to assess patients in pain, in nonverbal patients, ICU patients, amazing in all the different scales. But they'll usually have one to measure behaviors. Uh, and whenever it's fee feasible, behavioral measurement of pain should be used in conjunction with self-report. Well, if they could self-report, it would be nice, but this is usually for people that can't. A lack of expression of pain doesn't indicate that the patient isn't experiencing pain. So interpret the behaviors and, and make decisions regarding treatment of pain based on careful consideration on these behaviors. Example would be, okay, we look at the scale and the person has no particular expression or smile, they get a zero. For legs, they're uneasy and restless and squirming around, they would get a one and so forth, and they would total these scores. 10 is the worst score, zero is the best. Let's take a look at a quiz. So the most accurate indicator of, a pa of the nurse used to confirm the patient was in pain, A, the nurse's assessment of pain, B, the nonverbal observations of the patient, C, the patient's verbalization that they had pain, D, all of the above options. The answer is C. The most reliable indicator of pain is the patient's self-report, right? So C is the correct answer here. Let's talk about the quality of the pain. Descriptors are used to describe the depth or type of pain. And there are many descriptions. They may say it's sharp, it's dull, it's um, dull, stabbing, crushing, tight, burning. So don't go tell your instructor, oh, my patient's in pain. Well, what was it on a scale of zero to, I don't know, I didn't ask. Was it stabbing, burning, sharp, dull, blah, blah, blah? Oh, I didn't ask. And your provider is going to want all, these inf all this information. So make sure you assess pain uh, with using all this content before you actually uh, call, a, you, know, uh, you know, call for uh, assistance or you would call a provider as a nurse. Time of onset, when did it start? How long did it last? How long does it last? Constancy, do, do they have any pain-free periods? When, how long? So all this info data will be helpful in helping to address the pain by the provider. Let's talk about the, pattern, the pattern of pain. When did it begin or did it start? When does or did it start? Uh, maybe it's all the time. Duration, how long have you had it? How long does it last? Well, it comes on and, and once a month on this day, I always have it. Constancy, are there any pain-free peers? No, it's constant. When, how long? This has been going on for six months and I can't get relief. I can't get comfortable. So we need to ask this information. Precipitating factors, activities that preceded the pain. Well, I was working out in the yard and I was hoeing the fields, et cetera. Physical exertion, I was working out the gym. Environmental factors, heat, cold, humidity. Welcome to New Orleans. No. So anyway, all those can be precipitating factors. Physical or emotional stressors. Yes, I got the phone bill. That would be a stressor. Uh, strong emotions. Yeah, yeah, only when I get upset with my daughter do I experience these headaches, right? Alleviating factors. Describe anything the patient used to alleviate the pain. Um, uh, well, I put heat on it, I elevated it, I put cold on it, I used herbs. Well, you know what? I got up and I went to the store. Distraction, rest, medications. Was the pain relieved or did it become worse? And we're going to talk about that unrelieved pain soon. Associated symptoms. Other symptoms that occur before and after the pain. Like, oh, I get real nauseated, vomit, and dizzy. I have to lay down for two hours in the dark, like with migraines and that kind of stuff, if, it, if it's associated with this pain experience. Uh, what effect did it have on your activities of daily living? I can't sleep. Sleep deprivation is a big problem. Our patients have to get that one and a half hours of REM sleep. Otherwise, you know, sleep deprivation can increase pain perception, et cetera. Appetite. It would probably increase my appetite, right? Uh, no. Um, a lot of times they'll decrease patients' uh, appetite. That's the least of their worries. They're just trying to get pain relief. Or I can't concentrate. I can't work when I have this. Marriage, maybe it's affecting their marriage. Driving, I can't function. I can't go to work. And that is a big issue, especially nowadays. 
pain, past pain experiences, any past pain experiences. Oh, yes, when I get this, I can't work for a month. What relieved it? Well, they gave me an epidural, blah, blah, blah. Meaning of the pain. Worries and fears about the present or the past. I've got to work. I've got four kids. I'm divorced. Uh, I'm barely making ends meet now. I need relief yesterday. So assess the meaning of the pain uh, of your patient and coping resources, what helps the patient. Um, the um, effective responses. How does pain make you feel? I get real nervous, anxious, depressed. I can't sleep. I can't eat. How does it affect and make them feel? Class discussion, usually we talk about uh, patient, uh, family members or relatives, maybe themselves, that have experienced some pain and how it can be socially and physically isolating to a point where that's all they do all day. They try to prevent experiencing pain. Two major types of pain. Acute pain is less than six month, months. It has a sudden onset, okay? Less than six months. And um, we'll talk about each of these separately in a second. Chronic pain is greater than six months. It interferes with their activities of daily living and their functioning. So that's a big problem. So that's the duration. Acute pain, act, it acts as a warning sign. Great, you know, our body is so awesome in that it is, has all these built-in things. And this is a warning sign. Hey, we need to, you need to take care of this yesterday. It activates the sympathetic nervous system, so you're going to get that increased pulse, respirations, pupils are going to dilate. I might get pale and shunning that blood to my heart for fight or flight. So I'm going to see a lot of different indications that they are in pain. And it usually results from an injury. Maybe they had surgery or inflammation. Some of the responses they will have are increased pulse, respirations, blood pressure, dilated pupils, sweating, they'll get pale, and they get anxious. Behavioral signs, they may just get restless, you know, especially your demented patients or patients uh, maybe that aren't cognitively intact, but they'll start getting restless, they get confused, especially with infections. They get, can't concentrate, they get very apprehensive, and overall they will get in distress. So we need to be aware of this, these sudden changes in behavior also. Three types or categories of acute pain and somatic pain. Okay, it starts in those sensory receptors, the skin, the muscles, the bones, and connective tissues. And they'll usually describe it as a sharp, localized pain with swelling, maybe cramping. And, you know, that cutaneous pain, you ever cut your finger on a piece of paper, that little devil hurts, right? Are you spraying something? That is somatic pain, skin, muscle, bone, connective tissues. The next one is visceral pain. When we talk about visceral, we're talking organ. And it starts in those internal organs that line the body cavities, in, and um, it also lines the body cavities in the chest, lungs, and pelvic area. And they usually describe this this dull, deep, aching pain. And it can radiate, which means go from the point of origin away from the body to another area, or like a renal stone, it, can only, it, it may be referred to another area of the body, totally disconnected from the point of origin. So, referred pain again, uh, felt away from the point of origin, that tubercle pregnancy, pregnancy uh, patient is, was one of the prime examples of that. That shoulder pain, totally unrelated to that fallopian tube area, huh? Let's talk about chronic pain. We're talking about a beast of a different color here, huh? We're talking about um, it's a persistent pain. It recurs for more than six months or an indefinite period of time. I've had this for years. Onset is gradual. I was doing okay and I started feeling a little twinge and yesterday and today I can't even walk. It hurts so bad. And you ask them to put their finger on it. Now, acute pain, they can usually pinpoint it. Chronic pain, I just feel terrible all over. Very poorly localized. And they get depressed, usually a lot of times, because they depress those neurotransmitters, the serotonin, the endorphins, and all those neurotransmitters. Uh, they can't live in that state of high alert, fight or flight like that acute pain. You see how body adapts, and that's what happens with chronic pain. Happens over more than six months. The body adapts, 
and we're going to notice some quite different signs and symptoms from acute pain. And sometimes they don't know why the cause is unknown. So some of the responses might be mild or severe pain. It stimulates the parasympathetic system. Vital signs are normal. What do you mean they're normal? You mean they can be vital signs, everything normal, and they can have, and they're actually in pain? Yes. Chronic pain, their body has adapted. They can't stay in that high alert phase. They will go into exhaustion and die. So the body compensates. They exhaust those serotonins and endorphins, and they get depressed. They withdraw. My mom had severe uh, spinal stenosis, arthritis, and um, pain, sciatic pain. And she was a very social person. I always liked to go see my brothers and family. And to Baton Rouge, it's not like mile, hundreds of miles or anything, but she knew eventually when it came to a point, she had chronic pain, unrelieved, and she knew if she would go, go drive with them an hour away, she was going to suffer for two weeks with constant severe pain. So she isolated herself. She withdrew, and all she did was try to minimize the toll that that pain was going to have if she did whatever activity she normally would have done. So it definitely impaired her functioning. Often, uh, they may not even mention the pain. You know why? They get tired of talking about it. People, they're afraid that people get tired of, of hearing about it, so they don't even talk about it anymore because it takes, you know, it, it has a toll it's taken on that patient. Um, so you might have to ask the person if they're in pain and to talk about it. Pain behavior, again, is often absent. They're not restless, they're not anxious, and you think, oh my God, he is not in pain. But our most reliable indicator of pain, that gold standard, is the patient's self-report. Now, there are three categories of chronic pain. Moments when they have intense pain, then periods without pain. Your migraine suffers. They may suffer for two or three days or a week or whatever, and then it goes away. And then they may, it recurs maybe again. Uh, in another period of time. Chronic intractable benign pain. It's always there. Intensity varies. Low back pain. It's what, one of the number one causes of disability is back pain. And um, it's associated with damaged or malfunctioning nerves from illness, like diabetes. Maybe they've injured it. Phantom pain, like your patients that don't have a leg and they're having pain. And it's a burning, shooting pain, intractable, always present. Intensity varies. And chronic pain, like this poor little girl here, she probably has some type of cancerous tumor. As that tumor goes and compresses those nerves and compromises circulation and you get more swelling, it chronically worsens over time. People with chronic arthritis is an example. Now, this was my chihuahua, Chalupa. And, uh, she, this isn't my dog, but sometimes this is how she acted. I think she had problems. But anyway, it's a uh, breakthrough pain. And um, this is a, a, a really tough kind of pain that a person can experience. It's an exacerbation of pain spontaneously. It means the pain comes back all of a sudden in relation to a specific predictable or unpredictable trigger. Despite controlled background pain, right? They keep it under control, but despite all that, it comes back. And there are three types of breakthrough pain. Incident pain, idiopathic, and end-of-dose medication failure. Three types. Um, so the incident for pain, short-term predictable pain with movement or activity. All I did was cough every time I sneezed. Uh, my kids just said, Mom, it hurts when I breathe. And I said, don't breathe, right? Of course, they couldn't do that. But anyway, uh, incident pain, specific, predictable. Idiopathic pain means unpredictable, or they don't really know the cause. And that's a real challenge in one. What do you mean you don't know? Sometimes they don't know. And then there's end-of-dose medication failure. Now, that one is pretty common. And it's pain experienced at the end of one dose of medication before the next dose of the medication is scheduled. So you give it to them the medication maybe in an hour, and... Um, before the four hours are up, they are in pain. Let me tell you, if a person, we're always going to evaluate that pain. If it's unrelieved, depending on the route, you know, IV is almost immediate, but I would definitely give it about 
30, 20, 30 minutes to work in that case, but by mouth, maybe an hour. So we got to give it a little time. I would try some maybe reposition them, comfort, turn out the lights, anything that would minimize pain for that person. In the long run, I would reassess always. Unrelieved pain can indicate ischemia, or maybe they're going to lose that leg if I don't, because they don't have a pulse. So I'm going to reassess that area. But if I can't find any reason, I might have to contact the physician, and they may need to order uh, for the uh, medications for the time between those doses. They may have to shorten them or increase the dose. Sometimes I'll put them on a 24-hour pain medication regimen. But this is a very common type of pain, so read about that. Other types of pain, central pain. That's damage to the nerves in the central nervous system from a stroke. Multiple uh, sclerosis. It could be these are nerve pains. Nerve pains are really hard to treat, and it's often a constant pain. And they describe it as burning or pins and needles or an aching pain. A lot of you patients that have poor perfusion to those lower extremities or an area, they'll often have this nerve pain. You'll see it a lot in your diabetics. They're very prone to this. Um, so central pain. Phantom pain, okay? It means it's not there, right? The pain is felt in the amputated limb or body part. Now, wait a minute. Then I have a leg. What do you mean they have pain? It's usually a recurring pain. It's a shooting, stabbing, squeezing, throbbing pain. And if prior to uh, that surgery they were in un uncontrolled pain, the likelihood of them experiencing this is pretty high. And it's associated with neurological activity in the brain that once was connected to the amputated part. The body knows that it, it, it has to re rewire because there's no leg there. But it's letting, us, letting that person know there's a problem, yeah, there's a problem, they don't have a leg. So there are different therapies they will use for that. But that sharp, shooting, burning pain, like an electric shock, a tingling going down, traveling along that nerve, uh, it's usually chronic and very difficult to treat. I want you to, uh, and I know you're saying, Ms. Strand, the book says this. In Berman, your textbook on page 1089, box 46-1, uh, paragraph three, no, not really. Uh, you'll notice in the hard copy of your book, chronic pain lasts more than six months. But Ms. Strength is, we're going with chronic pain as being defined as lasting more than six months. Factors that affect pain, ethical, uh, excuse me, ethnic and cultural values, affects reactions and expression to pain. Example, Native Americans, they may be very quiet and less expressive, you know, they may not be moving around or thing, they tolerate the pain until they become disabled. And it's part of their culture. Chinese and um, other uh, Northern Europeans, they may be silent. Maybe it's part of their culture to be strong and stoic and not express pain. So you may have to observe the, those behaviors or you might have to ask them and explain that it is not a weakness. If they are uncomfortable, you can give them something. Uh, Japanese and Northern Europeans, they can be stoic. So again, remember, ask these patients because they may not volunteer the information. They are in pain due to cultural uh, type of um, practices. So you have to assess the patient's use of traditional remedies, practices, herbs, pharmacologic treatments. And their ethnic background and cultural heritage influences the patient's reactive or expression to pain. Uh, some patients, if you've learned in your culture, you should cry and moan and complain kind of thing. Not necessarily complain, but report pain and that kind of thing. Uh, in that culture, you'll probably have, the, their, those patients will probably do the same because it is acceptable in their culture. Um, so, uh, I don't want you to memorize the Japanese do this and, the, and the, they do that. I want you to know that different cultures may have different ideas on pain relief. And, um, um, and again, the way they express it. So we need to assess the patient's use of these remedies. Um, okay, let's go to cultural background here. Um, in some cultures, in, in, some, in the Mideast and African cultures, um, 
Self-infliction of pain is a sign of mourning or grief. And um, in, other, uh, uh, in others, it may be a tolerance of pain can signify their strength and endurance. Environments, unfamiliar environments, hospitals, you know, their alarms, unfamiliar routines and lights and activities and disruptions. We want to bundle our care, guys. We want to do what we need to do and to give that patient one in, to one and a half hours of un, um, interrupted sleep so they can get that REM sleep and not have the experience of pain um, that they may um, so that we can minimize that effect on the patient. And previous uh, experiences with pain, if they've had previous experiences, uh, they may, uh, you know, express their pain in a different way uh, or a similar way than they've experienced before. If they have support people, great, because, uh, but if they don't have a support network we can help modify the patient's reaction to pain, distraction, activity, um, versus isolation, and that kind of thing. Um, let's move on. Psychological assessment. All pain holds significant meaning for the person experiencing it, right? We as nurses need to remain objective. Oh, yeah, he, he's a frequent flyer, they used to call him. If they were coming and you're talking to the Emergency Room Nurses Association, oh, yeah, he came to Baptist yet last week. Yeah, he was, he was at EJ. He was at LSUMC, whatever. So, but objective. Remember, advocate for, pro, uh, for proper pain control. Quick quiz. When a smiling patient complains of discomfort, um, which statement by the nurse demonstrates an understanding of pain? So, which one would, uh, which uh, option? A, chronic pain is psychological in nature. No, it can be psychological, it can be emotional, behavioral, that's not all true. Uh, patients are best judges of their pain. You better believe it, that's the golden standard. Regular use of narcotic analgesics lead to drug addiction. Did you know that less than 5% of people who do not have a history of drug abuse get addicted to prescription drugs? Regular, um, let's see, amount of pain is reflective of actual tissue damage. No, remember I told you the guy that was really badly injured and the person that maybe had a, 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 a fracture? It doesn't necessarily indicate the amount of pain they should have. It is subjective. It is perceived differently in different patients. Nursing diagnoses in all your books is going to be, uh, your content is going to be under a nursing diagnosis, such as acute pain, chronic pain. So you'll see this used, but we do not test on nursing diagnoses, since the NCLEX does not. Planning. So what are we going to do? We're going to establish some patient goals. You see, I may never be able to relieve 100% of that patient's pain. That person, uh, legally, we're supposed to relieve pain. They had a lawyer, and he, um, um, uh, they had a doctor, and he promised this patient total relief, 100%. You have the surgery, you're not going to have any pain. Patient comes out of surgery, has pain, sues the doctor, and wins because she, they still had pain after. State the facts. Identify nursing interventions for pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic, and pain relief measures. Uh, and identify care priorities according to the patient's needs, guys. Um, so, what are we going to do? We're going to prevent pain immediately. You see, there is this phenomena where the person um, has an increased sensitivity of receptors after repeated activation. You know, they get this noxious stimuli. It begins at 24 hours. Unrelieved persistent pain changes the structure and functions of the neurons in the system. And that prolongs and intensifies the pain experience. And it causes this wind-up phenomena. And it, uh, as a result uh, of the increased excitability and sensitivity of those neurons, it leads to per persistent and increased pain. 24 hours, that's not a lot. And you'll notice in the book they have all the different terms and in your readings. You may want to take a look at that, uh, of how those terms are defined so you can use it appropriate in your charting, appropriately in your charting. Remember, if we don't address pain uh, under 24 hours, immediately 
It could cause abnormal nerve functioning and cause irreversible damage. Some nursing interventions, choose an appropriate pain control option. Deliver those nursing interventions in a timely, logical, coordinated manner. So nursing interventions, non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic. Non-pharmacologic in interventions, teach them the importance of good sleep hygiene. Remember, sleep deprivation will open that gate, and boy, they are going to have more pain, and it's probably not going to be relieved or take more medication. So we want them to have good sleep. Environmentally, we want to limit the noise, maybe turn out the lights, maybe have uninterrupted time for an hour and a half for that patient to get that good REM sleep so they don't get sleep deprived. Psychosocially, psycho laughter, humor is a very positive thing to close those gates. Positive attitude, self-care, learning how to take care of themselves, play games, it's a distraction. Remember when uh, Mr. Keller was talking about his wife and she was having bad pain, and then the daughter came there with the baby, and she stopped complaining, she was playing with the baby, distraction. Interacting with a pet, pet therapy, they use it in the nursing homes and in many facilities, releases those endorphins, and that decreases pain perception. Spending time in nature, just getting away, changing the channel, so to speak. Go watch TV, go read a book, interacting, volunteering, all these different things can definitely play a role. Non-pharmacological, massage therapy, yoga, Thai, all these different relaxations, acupuncture, or non-pharmacological interventions. And something to just, um, just FYI, is that you'll see these patients Four hours, man, they're on that buzzer. They want their pain medicine yesterday. And you think they are drug-seeking when actually they may be relief-seeking. You see, maybe the medications and the interventions we're using aren't giving them sufficient relief. So it's something to think about. So pharmacologically, what are we going to do for these patients? There are three classifications of drugs uh, for analgesics for pain. The first one are the non Opioid analgesics, or they call them the NSAIDs, yeah, um, uh, and it's commonly used to control pain, uh, and they can be administered by IV, oral, intraspinal, transdermal, fentanyl, transmucosal, um, subcutaneous, they'll use epidurals, and um, uh, these uh, also can help with patients, especially with chronic um, conditions. The non-opioids, uh, a first group, uh, the analgesics, antipyretics. Be careful with the Tylenol. You want to teach them to read those labels, adhere to the directions. Sometimes they're taking plain Tylenol, and they're taking a medication that has Tylenol plus an analgesic in it. And as we know, FYI, Tylenol is toxic to the liver and toxic to the kidneys. And with high doses, it could actually um, damage those organs. So no more than two to four grams of that Tylenol. NSAIDs, those are the anti-inflammatory anal analgesics, antipyretics. And the most common one is aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen. Um, and remember, we still have to know those side effects. Aspirin prolongs your bleeding. It causes GI irritation. And they can actually experience GI uh, bleeding. So, and if you take too much aspirin, they'll get ringing in the ears, but it's also ototoxic. So... Watch for that. Opioids, okay, and these are your maximum pain inhibitors, and uh, they have the maximum pain inhibition. Morphine is your gold standard, and the mixed agonist antagonists, they act like opioids. They relieve pain uh, when they're not taken with any other pure opioids, and they shouldn't be taken uh, with full agonist meds uh, for greater than two weeks, and they can cause withdrawal. And these are really potent. When they have severe pain, the opioid an analgesics that they will use are hydromorphone, morphine, fentanyl, meta meta uh, methadone, and they bind with the peripheral and central nervous system receptors and relieve pain. Most, this is the most potent class of your uh, pain relievers uh, when all the other measures have failed. Do know that when you're taking, uh, when they're taking um, these opioids, these, the care of this. Remember, they're C CNS depressants, and it causes respiratory depression, so if their respiration is less than 12, you 
may not want to give the medications. If they're over sedated, you can't wake them up. They can't answer questions because they keep falling asleep. They're probably over sedated. I might hold and question that. Nausea, vomiting, urinary retention, sexual dysfunction, and constipation. Um, assess for their level of sedation. Pissarro, that one of the nurse researchers that did a lot of research in nursing on pain, uh, she developed a scale, and that is on page 171 in volume one. Ask the patient what they ate for breakfast. If they can't stay awake long enough to answer questions, they're probably over sedated, and you may need to hold a question, the administration of that analgesic. Uh, they'll also use coanalgesics to treat conditions other than pain, but have analgesic effects. And they usually potentiate the effects of the pain medications, making them more effective or reducing the other discomforts or side effects of these analgesic drugs. Antidepressants, why, why would they use that? Well, if they're depleted in chronic pain, it will elevate, uh, decrease the reuptake of serotonin and the uh, uh, neurotransmitters that cause depression, right? And if I'm not depressed, I'm probably not gonna have a lower pain perception or higher pain perception. Uh, Anticonvulsants, they'll use those medications uh, to block uh, and inhibit um, some of the pain, uh, pain receptors in the GABA uh, area. Uh, antihypertensives, uh, they will modulate ascending pain sensations. Your antipyritics, uh, like hydroxyzine, prevents the itching, relieves the itching, nausea, and vomiting, which is commonly caused by a lot of these narcotics. Corticosteroids is going to reduce the um, inflammation and treat um, nausea and vomiting. Local anesthetics, again, to prevent that transmission uh, of the pain signals. And the WHO is the analgesic ladder. These are levels of pain, and your doctors will usually use these levels to determine what they will give for what levels or ratings of pain. So take a look at that and make sure you know mild is one to three and so on. Ask the patient if they relieve the pain. Remember, always reassess that pain uh, within 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the route, and document, and hopefully it's improved. Look for those behavioral signs of unrelieved pain. Use that pain scale. And depending on the route and the value and the patient's level uh, of pain uh, prior to your intervention, uh, you want to make sure that it's working on the patient. Remember, if pain is unrelieved, reassess that patient and the plan of care. I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, remember cstrand at dcc.edu. Thank you.